I hope you're all set, uh, Dr. Jennifer Ade. Uh, she's going to talk about what uh, is cell and gene therapy to cure HIV and SCDR and what this strategy, uh, why this strategy is more superior to others. So Dr. Jen, uh, she's an associate professor. You probably did not hear that. Uh, she works for the uh, Heart Research Center in Seattle. The Heart Research Center supports our cancer institute, isn't it? And they've done a lot of work to support the Cancer Institute, the Uganda Cancer Institute, where many of us have visited. So you're most welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to make this interactive, because we will just be hot and bored if we sit and don't interact with each other. Uh, how many of you know that people are on the planet who have been cured of HIV infection? Raise your hand if you knew that. Now all of you can raise your hand <laughs> because there are six people cured of HIV. We also have some friends who are advocates for sickle cell disease in the audience. Can you raise your hand if you feel comfortable doing so? How many people around the planet with sickle cell disease have been cured of sickle cell disease? Do you know? Well, first let's ask, do you know if people have been cured of their sickle cell disease? Raise your hand if you think the answer is yes. Now all of you can raise your hand because the answer is yes. How many sickle cell patients have been cured of their sickle cell disease? More than 2,000 around the planet. And we know that these are possible. The people with sickle cell disease and HIV who have got these cures, they were some of the sickest patients. The six people with HIV who are cured also had cancer. They needed very intense treatment. The people with sickle cell disease who were cured were some of the sickest patients that existed. These are two different kinds of diseases. HIV is an infection, a virus infection. Sickle cell disease, we're born with it. It's in our genes, in our DNA. We inherit it. So why, why did we bring you together, sickle cell and HIV? Because here in Africa, the mo most patients with both HIV and sickle cell live together. Sometimes patients have both. There's a picture I just saw in that art museum. People holding hands walking up the hill towards HIV cure. And the reality is that probably the same treatment that will work to cure HIV will also work to cure sickle cell. Not in the sickest patients, but in all patients. And if we put you together, you will get there that much faster. So we want you to meet each other and we want you to think about working together. So what is this cure that we think more patients can get? You heard it introduced, it's called gene and cell therapy. Where did this come from? Did we just pull it out of the sky? No. Nature actually showed us. 99% of people infected with HIV, virus goes up, CD4 cells come down, they have to take antiretroviral treatment, ART. They can stay undetectable and then they don't transmit for their lifetime. But if they stop taking their drugs, what happens? Virus comes back because it hides, right? But I said 99%. What about that 1%? What happens to them? Some of that 1%, most of them, they're people who get exposed to HIV, but not infected. Sometimes they get exposed to HIV multiple times and yet never have virus, never lose CD4 cells. Why? It's, the answer was in their DNA. They were born with a special piece of their DNA, something that lets HIV get into their cells, and it was missing. They're fine. You can't look at them and see it. They look like you and I. We wouldn't know unless we looked all the way down in their DNA. But we found these people who are resistant to HIV infection because of one change in their DNA that they were just lucky to be born with. 
We call these resistant to HIV infection, resistors. But they're not the only ones. There's even a smaller number of people that get infected with HIV. Virus goes up, but CD4 cells don't come down, and virus just goes away. They don't need ARTs. They don't show, they don't test HIV positive anymore, but they haven't gotten any treatment. Why? We study those people. You see in that artsium, T cells, CD4 cells, immune cells, supercharger talks how these are the cells in your body that fight infections. When we look at these people, we see that they have very strong immune responses against HIV very fast after the infection. And we also see that the HIV that tries to hide in their cells is not very good at hiding. So they can recover from the infection without any treatment. We call these controllers, elite controllers of HIV infection. But they are less than 1%. How do we make resistance and elite control something that can work for the other 99%? If we know the science, we know the cells, we know the DNA, how it works, we can try to make it work in people living with HIV, in sickle cell disease. You are born with a mutation that makes your red blood cells sickle. This causes pain, causes organ damage, causes lots of problems. But by studying people with sickle cell disease, we found some. They're born with HBS, sickle mutation, but they have no symptoms. Why? The answer was also in the DNA. Yes, they're born with a sickle mutation, but they're also born with another mutation that makes their hemoglobin not help, makes it healthy instead of sickled. Nature showed us those sickle cell patients with healthy hemoglobin. Nature showed us people resistant to HIV infection, and nature showed us that a strong immune response and keeping HIV from playing hide-and-seek very well can create cures for both sickle cell and HIV. But for many years, even before I was born, people and scientists and doctors were trying to find ways to figure out how can we make someone who's not resistant, resistant to HIV? How can we make someone who's not a controller control their HIV infection? How can we take a sickler and make their hemoglobin healthy? What has changed from before I was born till now is we have found the tools to make those changes in the DNA. And those tools are gene and cell therapy. Now, this sounds like rocket science, right? Space science, it sounds very far away. But it is happening. We started with the sickest patients, the patients who did not have any other options, who are very likely to die if they didn't get some kind of treatment. Because we know that this is something new and different and we want to make sure it can work, even for the sickest patients, before we start trying it in more healthy people. I'm standing here today, and all of these guests are here today, because we now know that it works. We know that it can work for HIV, and we know that it can work for sickle cell disease. But it's a very tiny number of people so far. Now, I have the privilege of standing here as an American, and in the U.S. and in Europe is where all of these patients, the majority of these patients, have been treated and cured. But America is not where most people with HIV and sickle cell live. It is here. So three years ago, Dr. Sissi Chichio, who you will hear from in a few minutes, she called me 1 a.m. Uganda time. It was in the afternoon for me. And she said, I'm hearing about this gene therapy, but it's not happening in Africa. How can we bring it here? And we started this letters you see on the banner back there and over here, GGTI, Global Gene Therapy Initiative. 
How can we take what we have learned in the United States and in Europe and make it happen here in Africa? And not me, an American coming and doing it, but you, Africans, making it work for their own people. So we have been learning from each other. We have been talking to your government and talking to other African countries, talking to clinicians and researchers, and now we're talking to all of you. Not everybody will want gene therapy, and that's okay, but those people who do want it and those people who need it should be able to get it. They should have that choice. We have to make that happen here. So I know, I think Dr. Remus is going to talk next. And he's going to tell you how we do gene therapy in these cells. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Before we get to Dr. Rimas, we do you have any questions you want to raise with Dr. Jennifer? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Jennifer. Uh, my name is Robin Abavidye, and I'm representing the Macari University Water Reed Project as a CAB member, Community Advisory Board. Um, my question is around, you've talked about the success stories, uh, people who have recovered, cured from sickle cell and HIV. Mine is particularly around uh, sickle cell, as much as I'm living with HIV, but I'm just wondering, do you have any successes from women, pregnant and breastfeeding women? So, uh, right now, because the clinical trials for gene therapy have been done in the sickest patients, they're not pregnant. One of the patients in the U.S., the very first patient uh, who announced publicly that they were cured of sickle cell because of gene therapy, her name is Victoria Gray. You can read about her, and she is a mother. So she had already had children before she went through gene therapy. Um, the patients with... Uh, sickle cell disease who go through bone marrow transplant. Um, that is a process that is, involves a lot of treatment. Uh, and generally, you cannot go through that treatment if you are pregnant. We are trying to make gene therapy something that can be done that does not compromise fertility. We're not there yet, which is why it's been done in the sickest patients. For HIV, all of the patients who were cured also had cancer, and so had received a lot of cancer treatment that prevents their fertility from continuing. So they will not be able to after. But we think, again, we can make it work for people and preserve their fertility later. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. That's a very good presentation, I must say. It gives a lot of hope. My name is Ruth Mochiri and I'm from Sickle Cell Association of Uganda. I live with sickle cell disease myself. And uh, my questions would be going towards that side. One, how much is the cost of this? Two, how long does it take? And three, if we compare it to bone marrow transplant, because we've been seeing patients go through that successfully, we have a few that have not been successful, but majority have been successful. So how do you compare the two? Mm -hmm. And how far do you think we have to go as a country in Africa? Thank you. So in terms of the cost, be ready to fall out of your chairs. In the United States, we are about to have two sickle cell gene therapies that the FDA will approve, and we expect that is going to happen in December of this year. Okay? The price tag for this one-time drug, which we think will keep you free of sickle cell for life, is two million U.S. dollars. Right. Three million is what has been floated. Uh, they're trying to bring it down right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is, and that is not sustainable for the U.S. healthcare system either. So we, we have a lot of discussion about this regularly. Uh, that is not a cost that is going to, there are only about 100,000 sickle cell patients in the U.S. and, and not even 10,000 will be able to get that and it'll be the wealthiest in those. Again, it's just going to create more gaps. We, we know this. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how we can get that cost down. I told you, be ready to fall out of your chairs. <laughs> 
Um, in terms of the time that it takes, it's not as long as bone marrow transplant, but it is more than a few days. So this leads into the question about how it compares to a bone marrow transplant. In a bone marrow transplant, if I am sick and I need to replace my sick blood with healthy blood, what we do is we scan all of you and we say, who's a good match for Dr. Jen? Maybe it's you. And they say, would you be willing? And you say, no. And they find someone else. <laughs> and then they say, maybe it's you. Are you willing? And you say, yes. Then you have bone marrow collected in a procedure room. Me, I have to have some chemotherapy, kind of a lot. Um, that takes several days. And then I get your bone marrow put into my body. Now, because you and I are not the same, and our bodies are designed to recognize, our immune system is designed to say, oh, this is not Jen, this is not Dr. Jen, that's an infection, or that's maybe your blood. It would say, no, 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 you get out, you don't belong here. So I have to take a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs, to help my body accept your bone marrow. And I might have to take those drugs for a very long time, months, years, sometimes. And there's always a risk that my body will reject your bone marrow or that your bone marrow will do really well and start to reject my body. And we have to take medications and be watched for that. But gene therapy, we don't use somebody else's, we use your own. So there's no fighting. It also means that I, I don't have to get so much chemotherapy that all of my blood and bone marrow die and have to be replaced. We just give a little bit to make some space so that the gene therapy will work. So it's shorter, but it's not one trip to the doctor. <laughs> we still have to collect your own cells so we can put the gene therapy in. We still have to give you a little bit of chemotherapy. That still takes a few days. And then we still have to watch you afterwards to make sure that you don't have a crisis. We have to make sure the gene therapy is working. And so it's not trivial. It's not one day or one visit, but it's not as big as bone marrow transplant. The outcome is the same in terms of no more sickle cell. Same for HIV. The outcome is that you go back to being HIV negative. Now, what we don't know is, do you need to take prevention? In, a, in an ideal world for HIV, after we cure you, you should not be infectable with HIV again. So you should not have to take PrEP or, or other prevention. You should be resistant forever, but we don't know yet if that has been achieved. So you may go back to being HIV negative, but you may need to be careful that you don't get infected again. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Anna Romshana, working with JCRC in the adherence and counseling department. But my worry is, is everybody who has sickle cell eligible for those treatment? And if not, what are you going to do to those people who are not? Another thing, as an advocate for mothers and young boys who are getting married, to know, because sickle cells is quiet in Uganda. People don't talk about sickle cell. Even the parents who know that we are carriers, they don't talk to us. Until we get problems with our kids in the hospitals, that's when they will tell, oh, we are sorry, you are a what? A carrier. So I want to know what are you trying to do to make sure that everybody from the grassroots, they know about it. Because if you are there to chew, but you don't have a baseline to prevent, it will continue coming. So I want to, to hear from that department and also to know that everybody who is now sickle cell is eligible for the treatment. Thank you. Eligibility, we will talk about because, as I mentioned, uh, the current gene therapy for both sickle cell and HIV has been done in the U.S. and Europe. For sickle cell disease, we are, I have spent six months this year traveling to various parts of the world because the way that they ran the clinical trials, they would have never been able to do them here. They chose patients who were very sick but had access to very, very good care for sickle cell disease in the U.S. that doesn't even exist for all Americans 
let alone people in, in Uganda. When the treatments get approved in December, anyone can come and try to get them, but they have to be able to pay. And it's not affordable, right? Um, we're trying to get the whole gene therapy community around the world to stop for a minute and think about who the majority of the patients are. I just spoke yesterday, last evening, from my hotel in Kampala to the National Institutes of Health in the United States because they were talking about these two therapies that are about to be approved. And one of the slides I presented was, look, here is the eligibility criteria for those clinical trials. Here is the standard case in Africa where the majority of sickle cell patients live, and they do not match. We have to stop doing clinical trials for very small groups of people in very small spaces and start thinking about how we design clinical trials so that anybody around the world, and especially those who represent the majority of patients, can be part of those trials. So we still have some work to do there, but we're making people think about it. And the best way to do that is to have doctors and researchers here in Uganda who know what those patients look like design their own eligibility criteria that are appropriate for Uganda. Now, in terms of advocacy, you're going to hear in a few more, I believe Evelyn is also speaking, is that correct? Yeah, Evelyn, raise your hand back there. Most of you in the sickle cell, sickle cell space, I think, know Evelyn. Those of you in the HIV space who don't yet know her, get ready. You are about to meet the Moses supercharger of sickle cell disease. Maybe she'll even sing for you. <laughs> we partner with advocates. The reason we are here is because we met with Moses and Evelyn very early and said, I can't possibly know how best to communicate to Ugandans. I, I don't even speak Ugandan, right? How can I come here and talk about gene therapy if people don't understand? So we have had community advocates come on the journey with us, and they do things like this, right? Moses asked you all to be here. Evelyn asked you to be here so that we can have this conversation. I need all of you. You now know. What, what were the first two questions I asked you? Have people been cured of HIV? Is the answer yes? Yes. Raise your hand. Everybody, everybody in the room, raise your hand. Have people been cured of sickle cell disease? The answer is yes. yes. You all know that. You can go share that with your communities. And you can say, it's not available for everybody. It's stupid expensive, only in America. But there are people who are working to change that. And maybe you come to our next event at Jabasa, or maybe you come to our next event at JCRC and learn more for yourself. That's how we bring people along on the journey. Dr. Ticcio is going to talk in a few minutes again, as I mentioned. She and I worked together very early on, and we created the first gene therapy brochure, like gene therapy, the basics. And do you know who was one of the first people to read it? Your president. Right? Right. And now we give it to more people. We're translating it into Lugandan and other languages so that we have more information to hand out to people. And part of that strategy includes some equipment and some other tools that we have been working very hard to get placed here at the JCRC. And we hope that that will happen in the next few months. Uh, Doctor. I'm happy to be the last one. I've interacted with several advocates. One of the biggest questions they ask is, you are able to cure malaria. You are able to cure... All other diseases have cures, cures, cures. Why has it taken you so long as researchers to cure this particular disease, HIV? People want, and I'm sure, Dr. Jane... <laughs> You'll hammer that one very well. Why is it taking you so long? Even up me, uh, even me up to now, I still have that. Why is it taking so long to cure HIV? Is it the money which you don't have to invest in laboratories to find the cure? Is it that 
you don't want to find a cure so that you can keep on seeing us eh? so that we can keep on visiting you in hospitals so these are some of the questions we have as community dr j thank yep. you and it's there's not one answer there are many answers some of it relates to science HIV is very clever. COVID-19, it doesn't hide in our DNA. HIV does. Right? COVID-19, you're sick for a little while. Your immune system fights the infection. You can get better. Some people do not, but most people do. Same with flu, with a cold. But with HIV, 99% of people, if they don't have antiretroviral therapy... CD4 cells go down, and then you get all kinds of other infections. I learned on this trip that you used to call HIV slimming disease because people lost weight, right? They lost weight because of infections, because they had no immune system. AIDS, what happens if you don't take your drugs? Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Acquired, you acquired it. It was an infection. Immune, your immune system is deficient. It is not working. It's not HIV that is killing you. It's the other infections, but HIV took away your immune system, and that's why you get those infections. In the beginning of the HIV epidemic, people were dying so fast that we didn't know what was causing it. They found the virus. They thought, oh, it's a virus like the cold or the flu. They didn't know it was hiding in the DNA. They found that later. Then I told you about these people, the 1%, right? Those people that can control their infection or that are resistant to infection. You have to find those people. To find those people, you have to be able to test for HIV, right? Because you have to know who has it and who doesn't. I don't know who's exposed if I don't know who's positive. So then we needed testing, and we needed that testing on a very large scale because it's less than 1% of people. So for every 100 people, less than one, right? So you need to screen a lot of people and you need to screen them a lot. That took a huge amount of education. That's what Jabasa is trying to do here in Uganda, educate people. If you get tested, if you know your status, maybe you're a controller and we can learn from you. Maybe you're resistant and we can learn from you. Maybe you're not, but now we know we can give you art and maybe someday we can cure you. So HIV is very elegant. That's part of the problem. We had to do a lot of work in a very short period of time to understand how it works. It works in a different way than a lot of other viruses that we normally see, and we had to understand that to be able to combat it. And then we had to find those natural cures that existed in the world and then study those so we could have a road map, a map for how we get there for everyone living with HIV. That is part of why it's taken so long. Money absolutely plays a role. In the United States and in Europe, people living with HIV stormed the president's house. In one of the most famous um, demonstrations in the 1980s, there were two groups. One group that's sort of like the Martin Luther King group. They said, we want to do it peacefully, but we want to make sure people know and we want them to understand it. And they marched and they built this quilt, the AIDS quilt, where every family and friend of someone who died of AIDS was asked to make a part of the quilt. And this quilt stretched for almost a mile. And they read, they took turns and read the names of every person who had died while this quilt was on display. And the quilt took up so much space in Washington, D.C. that people couldn't avoid it. Now, at the same time, there was another group of demonstrators. And we say they were like the, the Malcolm X. They said, you know what? We really need to get people's attention. They brought the ashes of their loved ones to Washington, D.C., they marched up to the president's house, the White House, and they threw the ashes on the front lawn and said, you better do something about this devastating disease. And it was happening at the same time that the quilt was on display. They changed their trajectory. They stormed the National Institute of Health and shut it down. They said, we are not leaving until you dedicate research funding to HIV, understanding it, new drugs, 
that is what we want and we're not leaving till you give it to us. That created funding opportunities in the United States for HIV that are, have been unprecedented, I think, in the history of the world. That investment changed a lot. It's why we have second, first line, second line, third line, and now long-acting ART. It's why we have HIV cures and bone marrow transplant. It's why we have a lot of gene therapy. 36 clinical trials of gene therapy for HIV happening in the US and Europe right now. Sickle cell disease is a different story. HIV, we've been fighting this war for 40 years, right? Sickle cell, we've been fighting since people existed. And we've known about it since 1910. More than 100 years, 113 years, we have known about sickle cell disease in the medical world. The answer there is also understanding the science is testing people, but it's another important thing that it pains me to say, but it's racism. Sickle cell disease primarily affects African people, people of descent, black people. And our medical systems in the United States were built by white people. We have been spending a tremendous amount of time since I became a scientist trying to change that by saying it out loud. We have no excuse. We have known about this disease. It is the, sickle cell disease is the most prevalent genetic disease, inherited disease on the planet. There is no other disease that gets inherited from your parents more than sickle cell disease. We have no excuse. There are not enough treatments. There has not been enough research. There has not been enough investment. There has absolutely not been enough clinical trials. And there has not been enough involvement of Africans who bear the burden of that disease in all of the research that has been done so far. We have to move both needles. We have to move forward for HIV, but we also have to move forward for sickle cell disease. And the best way for us to do that is together. Louder, louder, louder. <laughs>